were talking about uh, John Wesley and his a journey to Heron Hut, where he uh, had ongoing dialogue with the Moravian community. Um, Wesley then goes back uh, to England, uh, and so by September 16, 1738, Wesley was back in England, and as a result of this trip, uh, Wesley's naivete uh, concerning the Moravians, it began to wear off, and so he had a different picture. He had a different picture, a reassessment uh, of the Moravian community, uh, and while he was there in Hurrenhut, he saw some things that he did not like. And so on September 27th or 28th, Wesley drafted a letter to the Moravian community. Uh, and among other things, uh, Wesley noted the Moravian neglect of fasting, which for Wesley was not good. Wesley understood fasting as an important means of grace, an important means of grace that should be employed uh, in the Christian life. He also did not like the levity in their behavior. Uh, they engaged in loose talk, uh, and, and Wesley found such speech inappropriate, not edifying, not edifying. Uh, he also did not like their failure to redeem the time. Uh, in other words, they wasted a lot of time. Uh, and Wesley viewed time as a resource, much like you view money with stewardship, meaning that God has given us time. We are stewards of that time. Therefore, how we use that time uh, is of importance. And Wesley did not like uh, the failure of the Moravian community to, to use his own language to redeem the time. He also did not like their use of cunning, guile, and dissimulation. And what Wesley meant by that, uh, he did not like the Moravian he saw this among a few there uh, in Hernut, that they weren't straightforward in terms of what you see is what you get. Uh, that they engaged in what he calls dissimulation. During the latter part of October 1738, Wesley also corresponded with his older brother Samuel Jr. We were beginning to talk about that earlier. And Sam Jr., in the fall of 1738, uh, objected to Wesley's understanding of salvation. He, he had problems with it uh, in terms of how John Wesley had understood a Christian believer. And so for his part, John pointed out that he had some measure of faith which brings salvation or victory over sin uh, and which implies peace and trust in Christ, a trust in God through Christ, but the witness of the Spirit I have not. This is what Wesley's writing to his brother uh, in the fall uh, of 1738. He says, the witness of the Spirit I have not, but I patiently wait for it. I patiently wait for it. And John uh, also reaffirmed his definition of a Christian in his correspondence with his brother. And this is what he wrote to him. Quote, by a Christian, I mean one who so believes in Christ as that sin hath no dominion, no more dominion over him. And in this obvious sense of the word, I was not a Christian till May 24th last past. And so we see in this letter that John Wesley writes to his older brother, we see yet another specific reference to John Wesley's Aldersgate experience of May 24, 1738, 
and this reference was written several months uh, after. Again, it's clear evidence that something important, something vital uh, had occurred on that date. Uh, we also note how Wesley underscores this event, this realization of grace, as the time when he became free from the power of sin, a deliverance which Wesley himself deemed one of the salient marks of the new birth, uh, as displayed in his sermon by the same name, that is, the sermon, The New Birth. Now, Samuel Wesley reads all of this, he reads all of this, and then he responds to his younger brother, John. He says, have you ever since continued sinless? Do you never then fall? Or do you mean no more than that you are free from presumptuous sins? And then after these pointed questions, Samuel drew the only conclusion he knew how. He wrote, quote, if the former, I deny it. If the latter, who disputes? And so with that response, Sam Jr. is basically indicating that he does not believe, as John and Charles Wesley were both teaching by this point, that a Christian, someone who's born of God, is free from the power and dominion of sin, okay? Uh, and Sam Jr. disagrees with that. He disagrees with that. Um, and we'll get back to this issue again uh, in, in subsequent lectures. But at any rate, with this disagreement in place with his older brother, and by the way, John Wesley was not willing to give an inch uh, to his older brother. Uh, Wesley began to inquire, to use his own words, to inquire what the doctrine of the church is, the doctrine of the Church of England is, concerning the much controverted point of justification by faith. So Wesley began more narrowly to inquire what the doctrine of the Church of England is in terms of justification by faith. Now, notice what's going to happen here. There is Moravian influence in terms of the doctrine of justification by faith, but there's going to be Anglican explication and teaching. In other words, Wesley is going to see this very teaching of justification by grace through faith alone in his own Anglican materials, and he's going to explain the doctrine of justification, uh, not by citing Luther, but by citing Cramner, by citing the homilies of salvation or other Anglican materials, okay? So it's Moravian influence, Anglican explication. That's what we're going to see here uh, going on. Uh, Wesley also during this time published uh, Barnes' two treatises on justification by faith alone. Uh, the motivation and purpose behind the publication of these pieces on the theme of justification can be understood in a number of ways. First of all, if Wesley had initially received a Moravian Lutheran notion of justification by faith, then it must also be noted for the sense of accuracy that Wesley uh, was in earnest that such teaching be explained, that it be taught, that it be proclaimed by means of his own Anglican tradition. <laughs> Second, <clears throat> Wesley knew full well that like his brother Samuel, others would invariably take exception to the fruits uh, which he maintained ever accompany justification and the new birth. And so Wesley wanted to be able to give a reasoned defense of the liberty entailed in saving faith by means of the teachings of the Church of England itself. Okay, you see, you see the point? 
And then third, uh, by November of 1738, the time when Wesley uh, published his extracts, he perhaps already had some sense that his understanding of assurance and other matters, especially his doctrine of sin, might need revision, <coughs> might need revision, and therefore study in terms of the Anglican materials would be important. That would be an important, uh, a good thing, a good thing to do, okay? And so in the late fall of 1738, um, you know, after Wesley uh, is thinking along these lines, he hastened to London and he greeted George Whitfield, who had just returned from Georgia. So George Whitfield also was in Georgia. He was preaching, teaching there. Um, and then he uh, came back uh, and he met John Wesley and they had uh, several conversations. Uh, creative and unconventional in many respects, George Whitfield had already undertaken the practice of field preaching in Bristol during March of 1739. At first, and, and George Whitfield is trying to get John Wesley to go into the fields and preach, go into some cow pasture, or some market square and simply stand up and start preaching the gospel. Uh, this is what George Whitfield uh, was doing and he's trying to get John Wesley to do so as well. And when, fir when Wesley first learned of this at the hands of George Whitfield, he said he was horrified. He was horrified at such a practice. In other words, preaching in the fields with its grass, its mud, and its rain. And he noted, quote, that he could scarce reconcile himself at first to this strange way of preaching. I should have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it had not been done in a church. Whitfield, however, was persuasive as usual. Uh, and so Whitfield probably convinced John Wesley that he could save more souls outside a church than within it. Uh, and so Wesley, on April 2nd, 1739, to use his own language in the journal, quote, submitted to be more vile and proclaim in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking from a little eminence in a ground adjoining to the city to about, how many people? 3,000 people, okay? Now, I don't know if you've ever been in England, but I've traveled extensively throughout England and I've gone to many churches in England and most churches in England are small. Uh, there's no way they could hold 3,000 people. They probably could hold 150, and that would be it. <laughs> uh, uh, and so you can see here that this venue is opening up widely, that Wesley is going to, after all, be able to reach the people. He won't be able to do it within the walls of many Anglican churches, which can only hold 150 people, but he can do so by going into the fields or going into the market square uh, and proclaiming the good news of the gospel to thousands of people. And Wesley preached to more than 3,000 at one time. Several places, the numbers are much larger than this. And so when we talked earlier about three things are necessary for a revival. And I'm not suggesting, by the way, that Wesley started this revival. I mean, it's already, it's already well in place. But what I am underscoring is that Wesley is now becoming a very active participant in this revival, you know, which already had taken place in Wales. Uh, 
he's now becoming a participant, especially with his field preaching. And so now the three things are in place that we talked about necessary for a revival. You need good news. You need a message of good news to the struggling sinner. Real good news indeed. Those who are most desperate, uh, who need to hear the good news of the gospel. Second, you need a transformed life. You need someone who is preaching and teaching what they are living. Preaching and teaching what they are living. And then thirdly, you have to be able, you have to be able to reach uh, the congregation. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, John Wesley is able to reach the people uh, with field preaching by April 2nd, 1739. Uh, and so, here, uh, we're seeing his full active participation uh, in the great evangelical revival. Some clues as to the substance of what Wesley was preaching in the fields can be found in the journal of this period. Uh, in it, Wesley writes on April 25th that he preached to above 2,000 people at Baptist Mills on the topic, and what was his topic? Ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again unto fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, as Paul has written, <laughs> whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. And so, at the very outset of Wesley's participation in the evangelical revival in Britain, uh, Wesley preached freedom from the bondage or dominion of sin as a part of the good news of the gospel. Uh, in terms of this, uh, George Whitfield would be in agreement. I know you probably heard that there are many disagreements between George Whitfield and John Wesley, and yes, there were some important theological differences, but not in terms of this issue of uh, the powers of regeneration and the new birth. Uh, I, for example, have read very carefully George Whitfield's sermons on the new birth, which are wonderful. I mean, they're wonderful uh, evangelical sermons. They give testimony to the same kind of thing uh, that John Wesley is preaching, as is Charles Wesley preaching uh, as well. Um, now, they did differ on the point of um, predestination, uh, and they did differ on this issue. Uh, did Christ die uh, for all, or did Christ die simply for the elect? There were, there were those differences. Uh, and so Wesley cast lots. Yes, he actually cast lots to decide whether he should preach uh, a sermon that he knew, well, publish actually, uh, that he should preach and, well, actually Wesley's words are preach and print, preach and print a sermon that he knew uh, George Whitfield would not like the entirety of it. George Whitfield would love one part of this sermon uh, but would not like another part of this sermon. And what sermon is that? Well, it's the sermon Free Grace. It's the sermon Free Grace, uh, which Wesley published in Bristol, uh, which on the one hand criticized the Calvinist doctrine of predestination, the way it played out in that tradition, uh, and it also affirmed that salvation uh, is free uh, for all and that all who are in need of Christ may come to the Savior. And so uh, Wesley in this sermon, Wesley in this sermon um, actually is talking about salvation as 
put it up on the board here, make it easier. Uh, free in all. Salvation is free in all, and I'll come back and I'll describe that in a moment. Uh, and then secondly, that salvation is free for all. Okay, the difference between free in all, free for all. Now, in terms of one of these, George Whitfield and John Wesley are going to be in, in total agreement. They're going to be in agreement. But on another one of these, they're going to be in disagreement. Okay, so salvation is free in all, meaning what? What does free in all mean? Meaning... It's free in all, meaning no works are required in order to be justified. In other words, we don't have to do works, obey the moral law in order to be justified, but that it is a thing of free grace. In other words, it is a gift that salvation can be received by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is free in all meaning that it is a gift, a gift therefore to be received by grace through faith. Does George Whitfield agree with that? Shake your heads, yes or no. Does George Whitfield agree with that? Yes, that's right. He, he agrees. And we, we, sometimes we forget that, that in this sermon, free grace, Wesley is not simply disagreeing with George Whitfield because they agree on this. They agree on this very much so. Very much so. So there's an area of common agreement. What is meant by this second phrase of the sermon, free grace? Salvation is free for all. What does that mean? That means that Christ died for all. And all means all. Christ didn't simply die for the elect. Christ died for all people. Uh, all people. Uh, anyone who bears a human face. And here's where George Whitfield is going to disagree. Uh, because according to George Whitfield in his Calvinist theology, the Reformed tradition, Christ died only for the elect. Only for the elect. Okay? Uh, and Wesley puts aside that teaching. No, Christ died uh, for the sins of the whole world. Um, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know, Christ died for the sins of the whole world. That's going to be Wesleyan teaching. Uh, that's going to be the Wesleyan teaching. And here, here they disagree. Here they disagree. Um, and so uh, I, I think... You know, it's fair to say, and once again, you know, you're talking about a relationship of two people. It can be complicated. We want to be sensitive in terms of our understandings. Um, there was tension. There were some difficult words exchanged between uh, John Wesley and George Whitfield. But I think uh, over time, especially towards the end of Whitfield's life, that Wesley and Whitfield uh, could recognize one another as kindred spirits, kindred spirits in lots of ways. Uh, and when George Whitfield died, uh, he died much earlier than John Wesley. Uh, he actually died when he was on a tour in the colonies uh, in, in, in America. Um, and back in London, uh, John Wesley was invited to preach the funeral. Uh, to preach the funeral of George Whitfield, which he did, which he did. So, you know, we have to, we have to remember that and we have to put this relationship uh, in, a, in, a larger, in a larger context, okay? Um, and so, uh, by the time we get to April of 1739, uh, we see a number of things uh, in, in place. Okay, uh, and so despite the difficulties between uh, John Wesley and George Whitfield, by April of 1739, 
with the employment of free field preaching, all the major ingredients, as I indicated earlier, uh, for Wesley's active pr participation in an already happening revival were there. Preachers marked by holiness and love, a message of forgiveness, liberation, and peace to proclaim, and a suitable audience. In terms of Wesley himself, uh, the first two elements were clearly in place by May 24th, 1738. The last one was not in place until April 2nd, 1739. However, all these elements, as we've indicated earlier, were necessary, none to the exclusion of the others, for promoting and sustaining uh, the awakening that was sweeping across the land. Field preaching without Aldersgate would have been empty. Aldersgate without field preaching would have been pointless, even self-indulgent. Reluctantly, Wesley had found his calling, and grace would make his calling, grace would make his calling sure. Okay, uh, this, is, uh, this is the end of the first part of the course, so we can entertain some questions now. We have generous time uh, for questions. Uh, this is the end of the historical biographical part of the course. Uh, we'll entertain questions now and then when we come back uh, at the next session we will begin the theological part of the course and then we will follow the order of salvation or what is called the ordo salutis in Latin. We will follow that from creation to glory and every step along the way, okay? So, what questions or comments do you have in light of, uh, yes? Yeah. Yes, uh, these these are two basic uh, statements that Wesley defends and uh, unpacks, if you will, in, in the sermon, in the sermon uh, Free Grace. And so he talks about salvation being free in all, meaning it's not dependent upon what we do. See, Wesley had committed that error earlier. He thought salvation was dependent upon what we do. Uh, and he had to learn through Moravian counseling that salvation is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, which can be received as the sheer gift that it is, okay? So salvation is free in all. Uh, but then the second uh, one, Salvation is free for all, meaning that Christ died for all. Christ died for sinner, and, you know, Christ died for the elect and unelect alike. Christ died for all people, okay? Uh, uh, yes. Um, now, uh, let me illustrate this last point. I actually have a story to tell you. This is uh, uh, a true story. It happened to me, and... You know, I'm a very friendly, gregarious person, and I assume the best when I meet someone new. I do. I think highly of you as soon as I meet you, unless you prove otherwise, unless you show me otherwise. So I'm in my seminary office. I'm at Asbury. I'm in my office. I'm working away, and I get a phone call. So I pick up the phone. And uh, it's, there's a man. He was probably an elderly man. That's my sense from his voice. And he said he had a question for me. So I'm thinking, oh, this man wants to learn. You know, I'm a seminary professor. He's going to ask me a question. He has a genuine, sincere desire to learn. And then so he asked me a question. Um, and it was uh, about um, the whole topic of, of predestination, you know, predestination and election. 
And he said, uh, how could uh, Christ die for the sins of all, for all people, uh, if uh, the reprobate go to hell, you see? It seems that that's, he, he said the word, the phrase double indemnity, which is actually a sort of legal term, but he said, how could the punishment be exacted twice? In other words, Christ died for everyone, died for these reprobate, uh, and then the reprobate are, uh, they pay the penalty anyway, they are cast into hell. And so, you know, I was thinking he is genuinely concerned, uh, but he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't being sincere. He just wanted to trip me up to show that his teaching was better. Uh, so I did not appreciate that. I don't. I don't appreciate when you speak to me and you're not sincere. You're not honest. You play games. Because then you are insulting me. You are. And that's sin. Because you're not loving me as you should. And I would not do that to you. I would never do that to you. What you see is what you get, okay? I don't play those games. Although at the time, I did not say this to the man. I should have, though. But I did not, you know. I should have said to the man, the image is wrong that you're using. It's wrong. The whole image is wrong. We have to, we have to abandon it. We have to view it this way. We have to view the issue this way. And this will bring in the number of senses of justification that we were talking about earlier. Remember I said justification in the Christian sense? And, and what do we mean by justification in the Christian sense? We mean the reception, the, we receive Christ and his benefit. You know, Wesley's language, Christ died for me, even me, and saved me from the law of sin and death. There's another sense of justification, and we talked about this briefly. We said that Christ, that, that all the world, the entire world, do you realize this? The entire world is already, already forgiven, already reconciled. From God's point of view, they've already been reconciled. Why? Because God has given his son, and his son has been sacrificed. Atonement has been made. The whole world has been forgiven already in Jesus Christ, okay? That's another sense of justification, okay? And that, that is universal. So, here comes the image now. How shall we understand these things? It's like this. It's like a person, a beggar, someone who is starving to death sitting outside a bank. They're sitting outside a bank and they're starving, and, and they're starving to death. And inside that bank is an account, is an account, and it's in their name. It's in their name. And it is flush with cash, flush with cash. But they are outside the bank, and they are dying, and they will die if they don't receive what has been genuinely offered, an account with their name on it flush with cash. That's this second sense. We must receive Christ and his benefit. Yes, Christ died for the sins of the whole world. Christ died for all people, and all means all. But we must receive that forgiveness, just as John Wesley had to receive that forgiveness such that at Aldersgate he could write that Christ died for me, even me, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That's how I should have replied to the man who was being insincere, but I did not. <laughs> Good question. You're coming back with another one. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Я еще хотел вот вопрос такой задать или слышать ваш комментарий. Но тут уже достаточно вы изложили уже даже вот первую часть ну, темы, как вы сказали, историческую. Историческая тема, да, вот вводная такая. И по вопросу, вот, например, 
благодати, спасения, освобождения. Ну, уже как бы тоже какая-то картина понятна. Но не кажется вам, что это очень сложный механизм вообще, да? Особенно если для простого человека, там, да, какого-то фермера из Техаса или там, крестьянина из Сибири в России. То есть где-то, конечно, в научных кругах, может быть, это и будет неплохо, как бы звучать, да? А вот для простого человека, ну, мне кажется, это очень запутанная система или, как сказать, алгоритм спасения. Вот, например, в истории... Can I answer the first part first? Yeah, it's better that way, for clarity. Uh, you raise an important issue, uh, and this is a question that I hear in North America as well. Um, yes, I agree with you that we are talking theology. We are talking in terms of theological language. Uh, but I think we need to do that in the church. We do. Uh, and I think we can learn the theological language. It's not that difficult. We can learn. It takes a little time, yes, but we can learn what justification means. We can learn what the new birth means. Because if we don't use theological language in the church, then some other kind of language is going to displace it. Nature abhors a vacuum. Something is going to fill in. And I'm not, I know for me, I'm not going to like what's going to fill in. Because it will probably be political language, the language of therapy, the language of self-realization, the language of moralism. Something else will replace the theological language of the church. And so, I am currently teaching a Sunday school class in my own local church in Lexington, Kentucky. And it's composed of like, you know, 30 people and we speak theological language and we're taking the time to learn it because it's so important and the people are responding well. They, they understand the need for using theological language because it helps us to get at the richness of the gospel. Okay, the second part of your question. Ну, второй, он в этой связке, да, вот, например, концепция православной церкви, у них есть три ступени, э, вообще. Э, три ступени, как бы, вот, Бога познания. Первая ступень это вот богопознание, это то есть как бы покаяние и обращение, но они это как бы группируют в одну группу. Потом богообщение, вот этот как бы цикл, он обычно ну, длинный, у кого-то он там год, а у кого-то он может и пять лет идет. Это такой как бы период уже как возрождения духовного. И третий уже как бы ну, уровень – это Бога Вселения. То есть это когда уже конкретно, вот о чем Вести говорил, совершенная такая святость, если можно назвать. Ну, то есть они как бы немножко сжали и упростили. Но все зато понятно, как бы более понятно как бы становится. Yeah, um, the, your question is a good one. Let me start out by saying that different theological traditions, in this case Russian Orthodoxy, understand the 
order of salvation, order of salvation in a different way. Uh, and, and that's okay. I mean, there are differences in the theological traditions in terms of how they see the outworking of the order of salvation, okay? Um, I can give you an obvious example of that. The Orthodox would maintain that due to the fall, in other words, when we're thinking of the fall and its consequence, original sin being communicated to all of humanity, Orthodoxy is going to teach that original sin and that corruption that human beings are still free. They're still free to cooperate with God. Okay? Uh, Wesley's view on that is different because he follows Augustine. And Augustine argues that in the wake of the fall, and as that's passed along to us in the form of original sin, we are utterly corrupted. We are totally depraved. Utterly corrupted, totally fallen. Now, Wesley is going to see that the freedom that the Orthodox talk about is not in place. That sin is that serious, that deep, that corrupting. And that unless God moves first in provenient grace, and God does move in provenient grace, and restores a measure of freedom, okay? Uh, but if we consider a human being apart from all grace in light of original sin, Wesley's going to use the same language as John Calvin. This is a surprise for some. Utterly fallen, totally corrupted because he has an Augustinian understanding of original sin. There's no freedom here to love God. One is in utter bondage. All one's desires are self-curved, that sort of thing. Uh, we need the work of provenient grace to bring light, to bring a measure of freedom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I simply men mention that to illustrate that different theological traditions understand the way of salvation or the order of salvation somewhat differently. Okay, I would just ask you as a class since this is Wesleyan theology, to be open to thinking through how John Wesley understands the order of salvation. Uh, and I think as we, certainly as we begin with the second part of the course, I think it's going to make a lot of sense to you uh, when you th think about it in terms of your own experience and your own coming to Jesus Christ. I think what Wesley says in terms of the order of salvation, it will make a lot of sense. But granted, other traditions such as Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, even, even uh, the Reformed tradition. So for example, for Calvinists, where does repentance occur? It doesn't occur prior to justification and the new birth. It actually follows justification and the new birth. So the order of salvation for a Calvinist is very different than for a Methodist. That's okay. We can acknowledge the differences and then think about them in light of Scripture, in light of the Bible, in light of Christian experience, etc., so, yes, there will be differences. Uh, someone else? I think we have time for one more question. You have the last question. Yes. Ответов каких-то. Он уже утвердился после этого? 
Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, I think important things happened in 1738. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Wesley continually refers back to that year, even when he's not specifically referring to Aldersgate. He refers back to 1738 many, many times in his writings uh, as an important year. Uh, uh, Albert Outler had used the language Anno Mirabilis, the miracle year, if you will, 1738. So 1738 was important to Wesley, but we're also suggesting, in light of what we said in terms of Wesley's experience after Aldersgate, that he had to make some corrections in his theology and we suggested two key areas in terms of his doctrine of sin, in terms of his doctrine of assurance. Uh, Wesley is growing in grace, growing in grace after 1738, of course. He is growing in the process of sanctification, okay? Growing changes by degree. Uh, and so uh, Wesley, I think did realize in his own life what he had aspired to in 1725. In other words, he desired, uh, he desired that holy love uh, to be in his heart and reigning in his heart that he could love God uh, and his neighbor as himself. And I think that you know, came about for Wesley. It became rea a reality. Not simply a possibility, but also a reality. Yes. Ooh.